look at that. Welcome back to another episode of Chart Request Live. Everybody, I'm Spencer Israel with Stock Market TV. That guy is JC Perrette from All Star Chart. If you have not seen the show before, very simple concept. If you have a ticker, you have a stock, drop it in the chat and we'll discuss. That's how it goes. JC, how was your nice long Memorial Day weekend? Oh, it was lovely. You know, I got Great. I got three kids, Spencer. So, you know, we, we hung out by the pool. We didn't go anywhere. A lot of grilling, got 200 clams, ribeyes, the whole thing. We did it up nice. How about yourself? Very nice. I played some pickleball. It was a nice weekend for me as well. Pickleball. Uh, All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a great little game. Aren't, All you right, a little too, aren't you a little too young for pickleball? Nobody's too young for pickleball, please. That's, uh, that's it, the whole it, point. No one's too old or too young. All right. Uh, I see a few tickers in the chat already. I believe we had up on the screen what NVIDIA. Yeah, why not? Let's start there. It is the stock of the year, I suppose. Uh, so not much to say about it, right? Just all-time highs. Trillion dollars, Spencer. First yeah. ever semiconductor that hits a trillion dollars in market capitalization. You know, kind of a big deal. Like, look, I'm actually looking at the page right now. It is one. 0.003 trillion. So officially, it's the first time I actually see it. Uh, I did the math pre-market, you and I, uh, but uh, man, trillion dollars. I mean, listen, what can you say? Um, call it an AI bubble, call it, you know, money printing, call it whatever you want. Let's take a step back. Historically speaking, when semiconductors are leading, semiconductors are doing well. How's the rest of the market doing? Is the rest of the market usually completely collapsing in that environment? Never. Right. Semiconductors are, you know, for a long, long time have been a, a great leading indicator. In fact, we treat semiconductors like as part of Dow theory. So originally, Charlie Dow, bless his heart, you know, figured you have the companies that make the goods and then you got the companies that deliver the goods. So you've got your industrial stocks and then you've got your railroad stocks because that was the only form of transportation in the 1880s. And then ultimately it became the Dow Jones transportation average because you had, um, sorry, you had um, you had other forms of transportation like airlines and cars and things like that. Great. These days, how do we deliver those goods? Are we delivering them through Semic railroads and things like that? Semiconductors are transportation stocks. Is what you're exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So we treat it as Dow theory. So when you know that's how important I think semiconductors are. So when I see something like this, I, I, it's hard for me to look at it as a negative for the market. So the next extension, you take the extension from those highs. You're looking at close to 500 bucks uh, for NVIDIA. Here we are at 400. So the, the risk is, you know, you don't really want to own NVIDIA if we're below those former highs, right, which is about 350. So if we're below that, uh, that's your risk. So we're really nowhere near that. We're about $54. So you've got $54 to the downside. You got about almost 100 bucks to the upside, kind of a two to one, not the best, most skewed risk reward from these specific levels, but those are the levels nonetheless. Um, that's, that's the range right now, I think. All right, let's go to the chat. The whole by the way, show. semiconductors. Semiconductors haven't even made a new high yet. Look at semis back down here. Semis haven't made a new high. Nvidia already has. We want to talk about relative strength within the space. Wow. Um, all right, let's go to the chat. We got a few tickers here. If you have a question, if you have a stock, you have an ETF, whatever on your mind, drop it in there. We'll do our best to cover all of them today. Let's start with this question from Troy. He asked a couple. Let's start with Beezer Homes. B Z H Lee. Residential construction company. All right, so BZH. Here's a sort of a longer term chart. Let's go to um, go to a monthly just to give you guys perspective on what this looks like. Let's label it accordingly. These are homes. BZH. Right. All right. So here's your long term chart of Beezer Homes. Well, sorry about that, guys. So here's your long-term chart of Beezer Homes. And we are specifically, I always like to, you know, I don't know the market capitalization of Beezer Homes on the top of my head. I can, um, tell, I can tell you, it's actually a little bit small. I didn't realize how small it was, I'll be honest. BZH? It's $652 million. It's $650 million, um, and it's not, uh, and it's not liquid. Uh, so this isn't really anything that I want to talk about, uh, but you can just see the overall trend here. Um, you know, if you want to just kind of overlay, if you want to look at something like ITB, you know, you look at home builders, right? Because uh, Beezer Homes is a residential construction. So you can look at home builders just kind of more generally is sort of what I, I think is more prudent to do here under these circumstances. 
you know? So these are the levels in it's sort of like in home builders, right? And we've been making new 52 week highs. This is home construction, ITB. So I, I'd rather be looking at something like this. Right. And we're below this overhead supply, you know, but you know, how many, how many sectors do you, you know, that you can say we are that close to new all time highs, right? Not that many, but nevertheless, we still are. So as time goes on, something I think is worth mentioning as time goes on and we, if this is a, an ongoing bull market and not a bubble and, you know, things continue to rise in price as we've seen over the last year or so in the stock market, you're going to start to see this pattern more and more. Like notice the NVIDIA pattern. The NVIDIA pattern, we got to those former highs and just ripped right through that. That's one stock. And you got a few other examples as well. But you see this pattern, like it's a very similar situation. So the more and more we see these NVIDIA sorts of situations, and we're seeing uh, uh, more and more, the higher the likelihood that something like this is going to do the same thing right? Because it's it's a market of stocks and they, they act like they're brothers and sisters and cousins and whatnot. So something just to monitor because I think it's it's fitting in this particular circumstance. I, I, I should have brought up the other stock from Troy because he asked about VECO, VECO Instruments, which is a semiconductor, if I'm not mistaken. A smaller one, a uh, billion dollars. Semi and semi equipment, VECO. Yep. Let's take a look at these. So doesn't look like other semiconductors. I think right? it's like it's like semi equipment uh, related. It's not like a pure play semi. You know what I mean? Yeah. So VECO. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so longer term, you know, you can sort of overlay if you really want a chart of uh, semiconductors, and you could just really see the difference, right? In green here, you have the semiconductors already pushing up against new highs. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, the the big keep the big keep on getting bigger, right? Some of the smaller ones are being left behind, right? Even traditionally, they 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 move together. You know, you could see how in the past these things really moved in sync. And then more recently, it's just been tremendous outperformance uh, out of the rest of semiconductors over this. So that's sort of the the bigger picture uh look at something like that, is just so you kind of get some some ideas to how I uh how I look at that. And then I'll break it down you know, shorter term, right? Because if you're looking at something like a billion dollar stock, you're like, JC, I don't care about the underperformance over the last, you know, decade or decade and a half. I get it. This thing's a piece of crap. That's why it's only a billion. And here you have NVIDIA. That's a trillion. So someone's doing something better than the other one, <laughs> whatever it is that they're doing. So you could really just take these retracements. Hmm. Right. Go 61.8, and then you can go 38.2. Look at this more short term. And we're sort of in that range here, right? From about 32 and a half down to 16 and change. And here you got a lot of market memory, no doubt, right around 22.33. And then you got the market memory back here at all this former support right down here. See that? So here, what are we looking at? We're looking at VECO. So I think this is a good example of how we start out longer term. We get some perspective, bigger picture. It's underperformance or outperformance. In this case, severe underperformance. And then you could go back and look at history at what the where, what levels the market has respected in the past, whether they're Fibonacci or not. Yeah. Right? Whether they're Fibonacci or not. In these cases, it really just matches up so well with these levels yep. and you just see it again and again so to me 22 22 and a half up to 26 and change we're literally right in the middle of that range we start getting above 26 you know maybe look to sell some calls against that if the options market is liquid take some profits on a near-term trade something like that is how i would look at this particular stock within the context of that bigger picture under performance uh, H-Chan asked about Rambus, R-M-B-S. I, I'm not sure what, what JC, what you have to say about the chart. The only thing I will add is, uh, this is, this thing has a few things going for it. One, it is a semiconductor stock, but two, it's got a very low float. 
77 million shares outstanding of this thing. So obviously the chart is what it is. There's really not much you can say about it. It's gone parabolic. Um, but watch watch for these low floaters. Uh, this thing, this company does not have a lot of revenue. Just so you know, this is not like a mega kid. This is far from, uh, you know, in NVIDIA, AMD, far from their class. This is a company that is tra- stocks trading at 113, 133 uh, uh, trailing pr- uh, price to earnings. So this thing is uh, just sort of riding the wave here is, is what it's doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know anything about price to earnings ratios. I don't see how that's relevant, it, you know, particularly in a supply and demand game. The bottom line is if there's more demand than supply for a stock, regardless of any sort of fundamental theory, um, it really doesn't matter. You know, it, it, it's a it's a supply and demand. I mean, we saw crude oil trade below zero, right? It doesn't mean that it was worthless. It It, it means that that particular scenario the way it was set up, it was more favorable to be a seller at that particular moment than a buyer to the point where crude oil traded below zero. It didn't have to make sense. That's just the mechanics of the market. In the case of Rambus and any other stock for that matter, it, it's it's the, the madness of the market. Call it, it doesn't matter what it is. Maybe there's fundamental information that we're not aware of yet that we'll know six to nine months into the future because the market at the end of the day is a discounting mechanism for the future. So regardless of what any of those scenarios, it doesn't matter. The price of the stock is going higher. It's making new highs. It's being it's in the right sector, right? It's right, it's it's seven billion dollars. So you're getting higher beta generally than than large caps although with nvidia's move lately i guess you can't really say that uh blanket statement uh really right now um but nevertheless you know back towards those 2000 and highs people are talking about how we're a bubble how it's 99 2000 all over again yeah maybe but we're nowhere even near those new highs in a lot of stocks um so i would i would be looking at that 120 as far as risk goes you know where where do things start getting bad you know, you're probably looking around 40, 43 bucks. Right now we're at 66. So we're in no man's land. Uh, like some of these others, like Veco, no man's land, right in the middle of that range. Rambus, you could probably put in that same category, right around 66, you know, with, with a peak right around 130, 135 from an upside perspective. And then to the downside, you're looking at 40, 45 in that range. So um, look, you know, if we're, below, if we're below these former highs from back in 2006, you can't own the stock. Um, and then from a, but above that, I have no problem. I have no problem being long the stock target up near 130, 135. Right. Yeah. I thought you'd be more skeptical. Uh, what about IHI, the medical device ETF? This is from, it just says email account in the chat. <laughs> well, um, IHI is, is, is a, is a technology index for, for all intents and purposes, you know? So here we're looking at IHI. This is, um, uh, medical devices. You know, if you were to overlay technology for that matter, right? You were to overlay technology on top of IHI, right? What do you got? Let me see. Right? Yeah. What does that look like? It looks exactly the same. That's pretty uh, correlated. Yeah. You know, so at the end of the day, medical equipment stocks are tech stocks hiding in a healthcare body, right? Yeah. The difference, however, if you hadn't noticed here, is that lately things have changed. You notice you have technology. This is technology. And then IHI. Is a different so, yeah. color so, here. So tech has the higher beta, so we know this. So that the, it's, the... It's, no, it's not necessarily a higher beta. Tech is not, I mean, I don't think it's the higher beta. Let me see, I'll tell you right now. Well, um, I think it's probably about the same. So okay, uh, but... IHI I, IHI has a beta of 0.85, and XLK has a beta of 1.2. So technology is slightly slightly higher beta. It's more so the outperformance of technology as we continue to make new 52-week highs, yet the medical equipment, although they've been trading tick for tick for as long as I can remember, are not participating. So, I mean, I think that's something to keep front and center is that underperformance. Um, and remember, healthcare re- is the second largest component of the S&P 500, represents about 14% of the S&P. Healthcare also represents 20% of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So I think that this is a really important sort of divergence that we're seeing 
um because this is this is ihi on its own this is uh the health the medical equipment stock that's medical equipment etf that's part of healthcare and it's just not behaving as well as technology technology is making new 52 week highs and this one is not so something to keep front and center you know below 56 you can't touch this if we start getting up here and stuff like that and we're above 56 i have no problem with that but you know, with that underperformance and stuck below overhead supply, you know, and 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 by the way, I think that the S and P five hundred is really a sort of a similar situation as you can see here. The S and P five hundred is this green line, and then you have medical equipment. So I mean, you have very high correlations because healthcare again, fourteen percent of the S and P five hundred. There's a reason why they're they're trading together until recently. So what's up? Does technology have it right, and now medical equipment is going to catch up? Or is medical equipment, do they have it right? This is severe breath deterioration, and then the rest of the market is going to catch down? Or are correlations just continuing to drift, right? Because in bull markets, that's what happens. You know, in, in, in when volatility spikes in bear markets, you get correlations spike to one, right? Everything moves together, up and down together. And then as the bull markets progress, you get that deterioration in correlation. Maybe it's that, right? But that's that's how I'm thinking through it. Doesn't mean I'm going to buy it, but how I'm thinking through it from a more macro lens. Right. Okay. Uh, Rachel uh, of Fintuit dropped a couple, a bunch of here. And actually, JC, let's just pick one, okay? So I'm going to name a few tickers. You, you pick the one that appeals, uh, that you think will appeal to you most from an uh, analysis standpoint. We've got Crocs. We've got SoFi, Spotify, Oracle, Shopify, and Toast. I think Spotify and Shopify would appeal to me from an analysis standpoint. Any of those jump out to you? Not really. Um, you know, uh, I mean, no more. None stood out more than any other. Okay. Um, right, really, is, is is more what I want to say. But what I was talking about before, how you know these patterns that we keep seeing. Right. Here's another really big pattern that we continue to see again wait, and again. Wait, and again. real fast. What is this one? What is this? This is Shopify. Okay. Right. From Canada. Eh? Yeah, the own the lone Canadian tech stock. <laughs> so this is what it looks like to me. You know, you got these former highs over here that coincide with these pivot lows down here. You know, we could call it anywhere from fifty to fifty five, that range right here. And that's your level. And then to the upside, you're looking at basically right these levels right around here. Right? You got you got some uh some market memory right there, right around 80. Right? That former uh support turned into resistance, right? And then you have resistance up here in the low 50s. And as you can see here, this was support before, right? So just a lot of market memory right around this 50, 55 area as support. And then your resistance right around 80. Right. It's pretty clean. Unlike some of those other charts, we're right in the middle. Right. So do do what you wish with that information. You know, you could uh, if you want to play the range, maybe if you're getting enough juice, I haven't looked at the options chain, but maybe you could sell out. Of, you know, a, if you if you get enough juice for the 80 calls and the 50 puts kind of play that range. Um, my suspicion is you might not be getting that much. You probably have to go out really far. Um, if you want to be looking to buy a pullback down towards the low 50s, I like that. If you're looking to buy a breakout above these former highs with a target of 80, I like that. Uh, if you like selling calls against 80 or something like that or taking profits near 80 on a near-term trade, I like that. If you like a longer-term trade because you like this, this base um, and you want to start nibbling now and then buy a breakout above 80 and add to that position, I also like that. So you got a, a bunch of different sort of scenarios here based on my interpretation of, of this chart. You like you like how I framed it on, on different objectives? Because not everybody's doing the same thing, right? So right. Uh, one of those trades may appeal to you or maybe none, but there's a lot of different options that you could do, pun intended, you know, that you can do here. You take advantage of the range. You know, if you have a, if you have a longer term time frame, you want to add to positions and stack on trades that are working in your favor. Because remember, Spencer, only losers average down losers. So you want to be adding to winning positions. Um, and if you have a longer term outlook, want to be nibbling down here on this initial breakout with a stop below 50, let's just say, or something or, or somewhere in that range, and then add to positions above 80, you can. Maybe you could take profits at 80, let it digest, and then rebuy a breakout back above 80. Right? There's so many different things you could go about that. So I hope that helps, Rachel. Uh, here's one from Sam. He's asking about Upstart, UPST. 
which uh, over the last 52 weeks, actually, you know, maybe maybe a little bit of a basing pattern, JC. Well, like I said, we're seeing this a lot. This is probably one of the uh, uh, bigger underperformers of 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 the bunch. There's definitely some nicer looking charts. Most definitely. Let's just label this quickly. Sure, this is sure. UPST. So, you know, when we talk about these other bases, you know, like this morning, we were talking about this, the base and software, for example, when you talk about these other bases, you know, they're already breaking out, you know, they're already taking out former highs, right? And this today's up 10%. So it's around 27. So actually, it's actually approaching these former highs. If we start to take out 30, we could call it 30. We start taking out 30. I, I don't hate this uh, from the long side. 30 or can we get in a little lower? Uh, yeah, it's going at 30 to really to be safe, but then you still got work to do. You know, you still got to get back up to these former highs. This is a, uh, this is a um, credit services uh, company powered by AI. Of course it is. I don't know. It, yeah. It's so fintech. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's FinTech. So 40, so 40 is really, you know, maybe that level. If above 30 with a target of 40, maybe, you know, maybe add to positions uh, above 40, looking for a trade up towards 70. You know, I don't hate that because that's that former support, right? I don't hate that at all. Um, Right back to these levels. What do you think there, Spencer? You like this trade or no? Nah, it's a little messy. I mean, I hated it until I looked at the 52-week the one year chart, then I saw the little rounding form. It's just, under, it's just underperforming. Yeah. yeah. It's just that, that's the problem with this. It's an underperformer. So if you're going to be in these basing patterns, don't you want to be in the ones that are already working? You're right. You're right. You know, um, for me, you know, above 30, you want to take trade for a target of 40, maybe add to positions with a target of 80, or maybe just trade from 30 to 40. But below 30, it's it's still messy and still underperforming. So I, I'd, I'd be more interested above 30. But even then, there's there's bigger winners, you know? Oh, there was a few more. There's one I wanted to cover next. Which one? How about, was how about it? do I get one? I think this is an important one. You know, I think Treasury oh, yeah. bonds okay. are going to really, uh, you know, be an important factor here in this market. Um, you know, and 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 if Treasury bonds can, they, they've they've had a, a rough go more recently, as you could see here, right? Treasury bonds have just not been, you know, with the strength in technology. Treasury bonds and technology stocks have been so highly correlated, and more recently, it's just kind of just been a dud. So if they can get going and 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 these bonds down here, right? I mean, this was support multiple times in the treasury bonds, multiple times. So if you start getting a breakout in treasury bonds, you know, I think that that is supportive of a stronger stock market, lower interest rates. Um, you know, uh, inflation's not a problem. You know, all of these things that people are worried about, if bonds are doing well, uh, I think that that could be a, a, a scenario where, where, where stocks are doing well also, because Spencer, when you go back in history, you'll notice that uh, when when inflation is the big worry, stocks and bonds trade together. And, and when deflation is the bigger concern, you start to get that inverse correlation that you had throughout the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s, right? And the correlations have sort of shifted and become more positive over the last couple of years, perhaps because the concern is inflation for the first time in, in multiple decades since the 1970s. So that's a, an interesting theory that I'm certainly monitoring uh, from a bigger picture macro standpoint. But shorter term, it, 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 it's hard to argue against the fact that bonds and stocks have been moving together. So I will continue to bet that if interest rates uh, really fall apart and bonds capture a bid, I think that's a tailwind for stocks uh, that I'm that I'm watching very closely until proven otherwise. I'm open minded. I don't care. Okay, maybe you should bring up the cues for this question from Yako. Uh, he, he goes, I know we are super bullish right now, but there must be some type of impending correction or pullback in a healthy way to allow for more upside. Any thoughts on this? Well, I mean, listen, um, are we overbought in, in certain indexes and in certain sectors? Of course, overbought conditions are characteristics of, str of strong uptrends. You know, that's that's perfectly normal. Are, are we due for a short term pullback? I mean, sh I, I guess. I mean, you can. It's not so much about being super bullish. It, just to be clear, it's not that I'm super bullish because we're making new 52 week highs. It, 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 it means that we want to be spending more time looking for stocks to buy versus looking for stocks to short. 
Can we find opportunities to short stocks? Yeah. In fact, I was on Twitter today being like, hey, guys, what are we shorting? What, what's the best short out there? Yeah, of course I'm looking for shorts because I think there's opportunities from the short side. Um, it doesn't mean that I think the NASDAQ is going to you know, fall apart or have a massive correction. Actually, quite the opposite. We're really in a range in, the, in this range now. Like that former resistance that we're now above, like that's support here, right? Right around 330. And then we've got that range right around 370, 380 up here. And that's sort of your upside. And we're right in the middle there, right? So there's really not much, not much going on from a, a tactical perspective right here, right now. Um, it's more like, where are we within the context of this trend? The trend to me is not down. The trend to me is either up or it's sideways. Right down to me is just not 52 week highs is just not something you see in downtrends too often. Right. And yeah. obviously, and, and, and also common sense. Right. So we're making new 52 week highs. We're making higher lows, higher highs. We exceeded the last summer's highs. So we're either in a big sideways trend or we're in an uptrend, but we're certainly not in a downtrend. So can we look for shorting opportunities? Of course, I'm, I've been looking for shorting opportunities all day. As a matter of fact, is the trend higher for the NASDAQ? I think it is. Uh, at the very least, it's a sideways trend with an upper bound at 380, and we're at 340 or something. Where are we? We are at 349. So 38, 330 to the downside, 380 to the upside. That puts us where? Right smack dab in the middle of the range, which, by the way, makes perfect sense because how many other charts that I show you where we're kind of in a range, you know, right in the middle in between a bigger range. So I think, you know, I think I think that makes perfect sense. We're seeing it elsewhere. Yeah. All right, I think that's a good place for us to wrap it up today. I did not get to all the questions in the chat. If I didn't get to your question, well, you'll just have to get here earlier on a Thursday because we'll be back at 1 p.m. on Thursday, myself and Steve Straza, for another episode of CRL Chart Request Live. Don't forget to hit that like button, hit the thumbs up. We appreciate that on YouTube. Uh, any questions, comments, concerns, or if you want to know more about all the other videos we have and all the other things we're doing here at Stock Market TV, email us, stock uh, questions at stockmarketmedia.com. It's on the bottom of the screen there. And uh, that's a wrap, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. JC, have a great rest of your day. Stay tuned an hour and a half from now, The Flow Show, Steve Straza and Sean McLaughlin. See you there. Adios. I was holding